This is Vivian Howard from Chef and the Farmer in Kenton, North Carolina, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. In the studio today, Raleigh developer and modernist homeowner, Mac Paul, and joining us by phone all the way from Charlotte, North Carolina, modernist developer, Charlie Miller. We'll also check in with Matt Bliss and Greg Kelly, who have some unique modernist gifts to think about for the holidays, which are among us, plus a few minutes with Frank Harmon. That's a full show. Yes. And now, if you can imagine Tom Arnold, Tim Robbins, and the guy who drove the getaway car in Bonnie and Clyde all rolled into one, here's your host, George Smart. Hi, folks. Bonnie and Clyde was a great movie. It's over 50 years old now. Most people don't know that the real Bonnie and Clyde staged more robberies of gas stations and grocery stores than bank heists. Oftentimes, their loot amounted to maybe just a few dollars. The movie stars Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway are still around, and in fact, a little-known fact, Faye Dunaway got architect Charlie Gwathmey to design her apartment in New York, a place she's still in, I think, some 50 years later. You can see it at www.usmodernist.org slash Gwathmey. Her long residence is just another example of people falling in love with modernism. But you don't have to be a movie star or live in New York to enjoy great modernist design, especially the new builds coming out of the ground. Here in North Carolina, as all over the country, modernist houses and condos and apartments of all sizes are popping up from Raleigh to Charlotte. We'll meet two of the people making that happen in a moment. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from modernist realtor Angela Roll. In our continuing world of make-believe, Angela Roll is a spy for the deep architectural state, making sure that great modernist architecture was not wiped out by devout classicists pining for an earlier time like the 1800s. Codenamed The Broker, accompanied by our financier boyfriend at the time, codenamed Zero Interest, they were called on to restore the terrazzo floors in Saarinen's TWA building. Traveling from the AIA headquarters in Washington to Austin, Minnesota, they stole the secret formula for spam, which coincidentally makes for an excellent floor wax. Indeed. Or a dessert topping. On the flight back to Washington, Zero Interest flirted shamelessly with a woman named Jennifer, who was breaking up with a guy named Brad, who had just taken up with a woman named Angelina. (laughs) By the time the plane landed, Angela told Zero Interest to hit the road, and two days later accepted a proposal from International Hospital Executive Eric, whose love for her was long a pre-existing condition. (laughs) Today, she continues to defend modernism, dealing with unreasonable sellers, unrealistic buyers, incompetent builders, and bureaucratic city councils. Plus, she has some spam recipes that are surprisingly delicious. Delicious. I think it's redundant. If you haven't fried it, you haven't tried it, it says here. Reach Modernist Realtor Angela Roll at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or call her at 919-995-0550. Yum. Thank you, Tom. Since 2008, Charlie Miller has been a real estate broker in Charlotte, North Carolina, who has expanded to building exciting new modernist houses and lots of them. He's the founding partner of Five Points Realty and the co-owner of Williams Farrow Realty. The Farrow part is his middle name. By maintaining authentic modernist design and 2020 technology, he has developed a successful formula loved by new owners, neighbors, and even his competitors. And while his own lovely mom was out of town in Florida, he stole all her mid-century furniture to stage one of his new builds. (laughs) But not to worry, he put it all back. Such a good son. Welcome, Charlie. Thanks for having me. Mac Paul is a real estate attorney who focuses on land use and public policy. He specializes in obtaining regulatory approvals for large mixed-use developments and urban infill. He is also an investor in some of those projects, dovetailing his interest in green building and smart growth, including being a founding member of Triangle Growth Strategies. 
He's a modernist homeowner in a beautiful design by our former podcast guest, Brian Shawcroft. And he was on U.S. Modernist's first board of directors way back in 2009. Welcome, Mac. Well, thank you, George. So before we get started, gentlemen, have you two met before? There are a lot of common interests here. Sounds like it. I don't think we have met, though. Do you know, Charlie? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we have. Yeah, I just don't venture a whole lot out of the triangle, unfortunately. Then well, there's 10 million people in North Carolina anyway. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, one of you's got to get on that Charlotte to Raleigh oh, yeah. Amtrak. Right. That's a delightful trip. So easy. Charlie, tell us about Atomic Palm. That was your first mid-century modern development, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, thought about doing a small community development, uh, four or five houses back in 2015. And there happened to be a, a particular plot of land that, that became available in Charlotte, what's called the Country Club Heights neighborhood. Uh, Country Club Heights was originally developed late 50s into the early 60s one of the original suburban neighborhoods uh, around Plaza Midwood. And it seemed like an opportunity to, to kind of go in and, and design some, some modest-sized mid-century modernist ranch houses and uh, be able to build four of these at the same time. And, you know, really it was, it was a bit of a gamble. Wasn't, wasn't quite sure how the market would respond to it, but in the end, you know, we, we managed to put together a, a really – uh, really cool project there, cool houses, and uh, we we sold them pretty quickly and uh, kind of been following that formula since then. So describe these houses for us since we're a audio-only format. What do these houses look like, and what are they like on the inside? So the four houses there, they're all different. Um, we have a really kind of cool internationalist-style flat roof home. Memory serves. It's, it's around 1,600 square feet three bed, two bath. So, you know, pretty modest size. I have another house with, uh, with some really cool angular roof lines on it. Uh, this one was, was the smallest of the bunch at right around 1500 square feet, but still three bed, two bath. Then we went kind of a little more traditional hip roof style with, with some nice big overhangs and, and really kind of fit in with, uh, with some of the other homes in the neighborhood there at about 1800 square feet. But the most fun was, was doing a uh, close to 2,000 square foot butterfly roof house. So that was definitely a learning experience, but it was, it was well worth it. And uh, the same owners live in all these houses, uh, you know, five years later. Butterfly so. roof? Right. Butterfly roof. You mean like Dorton Arena? A little bit. That's a hyperbolic paraboloid, Tom. Certainly you should know that by now. I know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a butterfly to me. <laughs> So what, uh, we have problems with water collecting in the middle? Well, you know, we kind of worked through um, with a commercial roofing contractor to, to figure out how to, how to best set up that roof structure. And then, you know, we got some pretty, pretty substantial commercial-grade gutter systems put in. So uh -huh. um, no water problems, to my right. knowledge. Yeah, they're pretty good these days with roofs. I mean, you don't have any of the leakage problems that you had back in the 60s and 70s when people were complaining about modernism. Right, which is what they would use to just trash modernist design. Right, right. Oh, the roofs leak. Yeah. 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 So these seem like not terribly huge houses. What kind of lots do they sit on? So the original parcel was, uh, there was one home sitting in the middle of what was originally divided out as six lots when the neighborhood was developed um, back in the 50s. So what we were able to do was, with the current density and, and land use that was allowed in the neighborhood, is basically we figured out how to carve it up into five good-sized lots around quarter to a third of an acre. And we actually picked up and moved the original home that was there onto one of the five lots. Yeah. And then, then we built these homes out. So, you know, not huge lots, but fair size for what is now urban Charlotte. And uh, yeah, they, they fit really nicely on the, uh, on the site. Well, you're to be commended for not building McMansions. I mean, we don't need any more of those. Well, that definitely would have been easier. But um, <laughs> hey, You got any of those in Charlotte? <laughs> we got a few here. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that was the thing, right? It was like, we were looking at this from both a, uh, you know, a cost matrix and, and also, a cool factor, and I feel like we found a pretty good middle ground. You know, we maybe we would have made more money building a two-story craftsman-style home, which seems to be the uh, 
the go-to for most infill developers in Charlotte. But, you know, the other side of that was, hey, this is our opportunity to, to do something really cool and make a statement and, you know, really kind of kind of push the modernist and, you know, mid-century modern style forward. Yeah, we have a street here in Raleigh, which I won't name, but if you drive down it, you can see how not to do infill. There are 10 of the most extraordinarily bad houses on either side of the road, all just what you described, that look like they sprung up there like dark mushrooms in the night. It's just horrifying in a way. But there's room for everybody in this ecosystem. I just want to commend you for making these beautiful little small houses in Charlotte. And you've gone on to make more of them. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we we came off of the Atomic Palm Project with a pretty good buzz for, for the idea and the concept. And, you know, people really seemed to be buying into to what we were doing there. So, you know, I've, I've worked with a few different builders before I started my own construction company. And, and we, would, we would identify lots primarily in similar neighborhoods to Country Club Heights that were originally developed in the mid-century era and, you know, build two at a time here, two at a time there. And ultimately, right now, we are, we're doing a five-home project that we're just wrapping up in the Shannon Park neighborhood here in Charlotte. So it's going to be a pretty neat, pretty neat opportunity for, for five lucky buyers. So between those that you've done and the ones that are in progress, how many have you got about total? I'd say um, probably two to three dozen wow. over the last five years. Wow. That's impressive. And that's, that's with more that are counting ones that are that are in the uh, the plan phases and various stages of development. So Now, Mac, you're an attorney. How did you come into modernism? How did you decide to uh, join us here in this architectural club? Good question. I mean, I, I think partly it's because I have an interest in good architecture that's timeless. So I started out, our first two homes were in historic districts. So they were like 1920 era homes. And I just love the fact that they were part of our culture here and they were they were timeless in that way. My my daughter always says, um, I went on a trip to Japan like around the year 2000 and I came back and decided we had to move to a modernist house. <laughs> so that <laughs> obviously, do <laughs> I don't know what it was. Yeah, that had an impact in terms of that style. And it just so happens, as you know, we have a lot of very timeless modern modern homes in Raleigh due to the College of Design. So we just started looking at that period and ended up finding our home now. And I always remember we were closing on 9-11. So it's easy oh. to remember that that date. But, of course, they shut all the financial markets and it was delayed. But that's when we moved to our house. So we're still there. So you've been there 20 years almost. Almost. And over time, you've done some nice things to it. Yeah, I, I love the fact that our house was designed by a great architect, Brian Shawcroft. The kitchen area was done in the early 90s by the Cannons, who okay. were a very well-regarded modernist uh, firm here. Then we hired Tonic Design in the early 2000s to do a major renovation, new detached garage, and then got to know Robbie Johnson at that time when he was working with uh, Vinnie Petrarca at Tonic. And we were actually steered to Tonic by the dean of the College of Design as like this new up-and-coming firm, and you need to get to know these guys. They were just starting out. And since then, um, more recently, Robbie just completed another pretty substantial project on our house. So we've had a lot of different hands of modernist architects from the local Really? Area. There should be a historical plaque up there somewhere, Mac. <laughs> I know. That's what we're shooting for. <laughs> A little something in brass three, by the three doorway. Three generations, that's right. Right. And what's the latest thing you've done to the house? Well, we're we're just about to redo the, the main entrance. And the house, looking at it from the side, you can, can see through the house through uh, two plate glass windows. But we're removing the door and putting a, a full glass pivot door that's about eight feet in height. And, and new cabinetry in the entranceway. So it'll be more transparent. And like our house is... From the street, it's it's hard to see, and people often get confused trying to figure out where the front door is. You have to come down a very long driveway, cross a creek. But once you get there, it'll be a very dramatic presence. You've been a uh, real estate and, and land use attorney for a long time. Did something else happen on that trip from Japan? Did you start wanting to do this in your work as well? Yeah, I mean, probably a little later. Yeah. Uh, but the more... 
that's the one. I mean, I enjoy working on many great projects here. Very fortunate to have the folks I work with, developers in this market, a lot of folks trying to get into Raleigh from all over the country to do projects now. But the one thing about working in my world, it's always someone else's vision. And, you know, again, you know, I'm fortunate to be a part of those in many cases, but it's not like your baby, something that you created. And so over time, you know, have and with my love of architecture, got interested in trying to um, do a few of my own. So what was your first baby, Mac? Um, well, just in terms of what prompted this and really how I got into it, a good friend of mine and now partner, Frank Thompson, who was one of the founders of the Contemporary Art Museum, oh, sure. Cam Raleigh, brought down Paul Goldberger for a full day. I'm not sure if you participated, but it was a symposium called Build Raleigh Better. Idea being, and if you know Frank, you know kind of how he views <laughs> a lot of what's been built here in the last 30 years, not too favorably, but wanted to elevate the discussion around design in Raleigh and you know how we might stretch for, for something more. And out of that day-long conversation, we started talking about, you know, why not doing our own projects? So I had some friends and clients who are local developers who are doing smaller scale projects. And one of the challenges we all know, if you travel anywhere in the United States, any city, you, you tend to see the same sort of uh, box, that, that five-story stick-built apartment, 150. With those fake terraces fake sticking terraces, out? Fake terraces, yes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's very much a function of the financial market and what, you know, is being financed. So it, it limits what you can do. So that, you know, we knew we had to break outside that model if we we're going to do something more uh, inspiring. And we were able to find some good sites. And our first project, you know, I can go into a little more detail, was a fair weather that's nearly complete in Raleigh in the warehouse district. Good. We'll talk about the fair weather in just a minute. Charlie, tell me about stealing your mom's furniture. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my mom, really, I have to give her credit for really introducing me to the architecture in general and specifically, you know, mid-century modernism. Um, the woman has taste and they have a small ranch house here in, in Charlotte. All the grandkids live here. Um, but my father works in Florida, so they, they spent a good bit of time down there. And I, I had a I had a house uh, finishing up right when they were heading back down south. And uh, there was just a bunch of great furniture in there. And staging's expensive, and it's really hard to, <laughs> to find the right kind of furniture from your average stager. So uh, <laughs> I had it moved into the new house to stage it, got a bunch of great pictures, and Got the house under contract within a day, and by the time they were back up in Charlotte, the furniture was back where uh, where they left it. So, so your mom was – where was your mom? Was she down in Florida? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think you're yeah. going to offer her like a folding chair or something <laughs> to sit. <laughs> no, it was right where she left it when, when she got back. So Did you tell her? Out. Oh, yeah. Oh, I guess no, you she did. Was, she was thrilled that we were able to use her stuff, and, and it helped us sell this home. So That's great. With all these units that you have built in Charlotte, these these beautiful little modernist houses hitting the market, how has that affected real estate there? Are other people copying you now? You know, it it definitely seems like that's the case. And, uh, you know, th there are some newer developers here, small small guys like me, that are, they're, they're kind of putting their own spin on it and, and realizing that, you know, there's definitely a demand for, for this style of home. And and also affordability is a factor too. So being able to to build at a certain size and be able to offer it at a certain price in a hot Charlotte market, these houses don't last long. So they're just fewer and further between. But the ones done right, you know, they they move. And I imagine people just really adore them. I just they you have to pry them out of there. Absolutely. Mac, tell us about the Fairweather. This is a building that's designed by some of our past podcast guests, Robbie Johnston and Craig Karens of Raleigh Architecture. It's condos, right? That's, that's right. Right? 45 units. And um, who can get excited about more condos in a city? But <laughs> if you look at the plans for this, this is really a remarkable building, isn't it? It is. We are very proud and happy that um, Raleigh Architecture, they, they, they took on a lot and never having done something of this scale also, the condominium market sort of dried up after the 08 recession. So 
you know, have not been a lot built in Raleigh, actually. You know, mostly they're just these um, apartments that I alluded to earlier. And they're not easy to finance because you have to sell a lot of units before you can start building. But it, you know, it's an interesting site. It's sort of um, on the edge of the warehouse district, pretty gritty area. I think Robbie and Craig did a really good job responding to that context with this design. New building type, uh, metal type skin that is, I think, different and interesting. And then just doing um, a more durable concrete construction type that is more expensive, but it gives it a much more high quality feel to the product. It looks like it should be in a city like, you know, Washington or New York. I mean, it looks really good from the outside. Well, it even looks better on the inside. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And you're close to having people moving in, right? That's right. I mean, unfortunately, with the pandemic, it's, it's slowed us down a little bit in completion. We're about probably um, six weeks behind right now. But supposedly, we knock on wood, the first residents will be moving in at the very beginning of November and closing fairly quickly you know, once people start moving in floor by floor. Nice. And Charlie, fun fact for you, the Amtrak station is right next door. So when you come to visit, you can walk across the street and see the fair weather with Mac. Looking forward to that. Yeah, Our forward. Amtrak station is really cool now. Yeah. Union Station. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I was it's, down there a couple of months ago and was like, what? It's terrific. Yeah. It is a terrific train station. Charlie, besides putting all together these houses for other people, you doubled down and did your own project. Tell us about that. Yeah. So last year, I decided to purchase uh, what in Charlotte's known as the Cohen Fumero House from Preservation, North Carolina. The Cohen Fumero House was designed by Murray Wisnett, architect who studied at NC State, built 1960, 1961. And it was designed in the internationalist style, high style of the day. And it's it's one of the few remaining homes uh, in that category in the Charlotte region. And it's situated in, in East Charlotte on about an acre of land. The house had been sitting vacant for a number of years, uh, flat roof home. Oh, that's never good. <laughs> yeah. When I walked in, uh, holes in the roof, water's coming in, and it was, it, it, you know, it, it was a mess. But I could tell, you know, how special the home used to be and could be and felt like I was the right person to, to be able to, to save it. And, you know, the home is a designated uh, historic landmark, so... I had to go through, you know, a pretty pretty rigorous process for approval on the purchase side of this and also the renovation plans or I should say preservation plans. And uh, it took me about a year to, to renovate this 1,800 square foot home, but, you know, finished up in August and uh, and I live here now. And it's it's quite the experience. I love it. And you recently had it on tour for the Charlotte Museum of History? Yeah. So um, last, not September 2020, September 2019, after we did a lot of the demo and got the house dried in, we, we opened it up for the Mad About Modern Tour here in Charlotte and had several hundred into the, you know, maybe been close to a thousand people kind of come through and, and look at this house that had kind of been taken apart and put back together to a, to a certain point uh, to try to give people an idea of a before and after. So once we were finished, went back on the tour this year, and everybody was able to come through and, and see it virtually and uh, spend time in the, in the space that way. So it was, it was neat to be able to, to let folks see where it came from and, and where it ended up. And you've been documenting this on all types of social media over that year. Yeah, yeah. On Instagram, uh, that's primarily where, where we've kind of been sharing things uh, in relation to the renovation and everything. So uh, you can kind of see everything over the course of the last year and, and where we started from and, and where we're ending up now. And where we're, the house is basically completely furnished just about. And my, my mother has been helping me source some really great pieces. And yeah, it's, I think it's, it's looking great. And it, it feels good to, to be able to live in this space. What's the Instagram account, Charlie? Cohen Fumero House. Spell it for us. So the spelling for that is C-O-H-E-N-F-U-M-E-R-O-H-O-U-S-E. Cohen Cohen Fumero Fumero House House. on Instagram. That's right. And you can see the full story of this. So this fall, the next 
phase of, of my project is doing a comprehensive landscaping renovation, you know, just bringing these grounds back to where they were in the 60s when, when Jose Fumero's parents, who were expert gardeners, had it, from all accounts I've heard, just looking looking amazing. So I've got my work cut out for me working outside uh, through this fall and into the winter. Now, Mac, buildings like the Fairweather, these 45 condos, this is the stuff that and people talk about all the time. I like talk about for years. Like architects sit in bars and bitch about how the fact that there's no good design in their city. So how did you actually come about finding people who wanted to invest and put the money into this? Because it seems like the holy grail here. Yes, and I would say our investors are, like any investors, looking for return and weighing the options in the market and, you know, based on the pro forma and the location and all those factors. So I would say, you know, on one hand, and we, we only have a handful of investors with that project, the design aspect was only a small part of their decision making. Uh, they're looking at other metrics. But I would say to a person, they're extremely proud of what they feel like this project will mean to the city in terms of making a mark and being Mm -hmm. a noteworthy project. But I think there are a lot of things we now can point to about design that bore out the thesis that we started with that is, you know, there is a market for good design and, you know, a way of kind of measuring that. And we, we now have some really interesting data points to prove that. But how do you find the people involved? Because it seems like, I mean, everybody says good design is is great, but you actually got people who were willing to say yes to that. I mean, you could have built another gray six-story building with fake terraces. I mean, how come you didn't do that? I mean, you could still make money on that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the design— <laughs> sleep at night, but make <laughs> right. money. But, you know, I mean, the whole point of us doing this, as I mentioned with Frank, was to do something innovative. So okay. that was sort of our starting point, and then it was mainly— finding investors who are willing to to back that project. Okay. And so what do the investors do? Do they have to come up with like the down payment part of it and then you get a loan? How does it work, sort of the mechanics? Yeah, so the investors are putting in the equity. And so there's a certain portion of the financing that would be from equity, some from debt. As I mentioned, we had to sell a certain, um, I think, 50%. That number changed as the markets changed over time. I think we started at needing to sell 60% of the units before we could break ground. I think it ended up being 50% of the units. And so, and, and the equity was in early in order for us to close on the land and to do all the architectural renderings and all the permitting to get in a position to sell the units in order to get the debt to start the construction okay. of the project. Okay. And how long did it take to build it? Well, we broke ground. Um, it's going to be like 18 months. Okay. Which is not bad, really. It's about, you know, it's probably could have been 16 if I think the health issues had not hit. Yeah. What else are you involved in besides the Fairweather? We have several other projects. Um, one that is coming out of the ground now in Durham called The Grove. It is 62 townhome units right across the street from the police headquarters, which, uh, thanks to y'all in part, helped save uh, Milton Small designed mid-century police headquarters, which is now part of a big mixed-use project that Fallon, based in Boston, is doing. So it's in a good area near the ballpark and American Tobacco. But in that case, the, the challenge there was to figure out, we, we could have easily done like a, an apartment or some uh, big kind of building because it's a fairly large site, but we wanted to do townhomes to try to kind of fit more with the context as downtown is transitioning to a single family neighborhood. But we needed to get a good number of townhomes on that site. And we found through a, a mutual friend, a firm based in San Francisco, David Baker Architects, very well known for modernism and also done a, a good bit of affordable right, housing. Right. Who had a lot of experience where land is an extreme premium on the West Coast, so knew how to look at this site and figure out how to make it work. And they're also um, extremely um, good on their kind of landscaping and outdoor public space. So it's very interconnected with walkways and um, all sorts of outdoor space around the Is this of, just south of the yes. of the police station? Yes, just okay. to the south. Sort of near where that freeway comes Correct. through. Okay. And then we have a couple of other sites that were just in the planning process. Okay. Charlie, 
Tell me about yeah. the modernist scene in Charlotte now. I know for a long time in the late 2000s, early 2010s, you had a group called Historic Charlotte that was doing a lot of tours. And then now it's under the auspices of the Charlotte Museum of History. Are people getting more into new modern or are they tend to go back and, and renovate the old ranches? So I'm seeing a mixed bag, really, and which is great. I don't think it could be any better than that. So we have really good housing stock of, of mid-century era homes, some on the traditional side, uh, some on the modernist side. You know, in these mid-century era neighborhoods, which, you know, originally were the su- suburbs of Charlotte, but are now considered to be in town. So it seems to me that these existing homes built in that era are, you know, they were they were well built, mostly brick homes, uh, things of that nature, and really kind of offer a good canvas for for people that are interested in, in kind of renovating these these older, outdated homes and putting a modern twist on them in a lot of cases. The other side of that is as these in-town neighborhoods continue to, to be revitalized and come back from periods of decline in the past, uh, infill building opportunities present themselves, and I, I'm definitely seeing more and more modernist infill homes and then smaller developments kind of closer into, uh, into uptown Charlotte. Not so much out towards the suburban areas, but definitely in the in the more urban areas with the new infill modernist homes. Now, has UNC Charlotte School of Architecture invited you to speak yet, Charlie? <laughs> you know, they they have not. Um, but I I'd, I'd be happy to come and come and chat with them. I have done a few panel discussions and, and things like that before COVID, just kind of kind of talking about modernist development and and building affordably and 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 all that good stuff. So I'm. I'm happy to take any chance I can to kind of continue uh, the push in that direction. Because you are you are really living the the architect's dream here. This is what they talk about all the time of being able to successfully build small, affordable, well designed houses in infill, and it so rarely gets done. So you're doing a great job. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us today. This has been a pleasure. I do hope you guys get to have a beer with each other at some point. I do as well. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for being with us, Mac. Thanks, George. And thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much. The holidays are coming up, and for a lot of us, it's going to be very different. Family gatherings are still going to happen, but because of the virus, they'll be far fewer than, well any year in the last 80 <laughs> yeah. that you might name. One happy holiday element that thankfully is not going away are the loving gifts people give each other under the Christmas tree or under the menorah or under the Festivus pole. And today we have two purveyors of very unique modernist gifts, Matt Bliss of Modern Christmas Trees and Greg Kelly of Modbox. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hey, George. Happy holidays. Absolutely. So have the two of you met before? Yes, I believe that we did meet. Um, We met at the Dwell on Design show, and I believe it was Los Angeles a few years ago. Yep, way back in 2014, actually. 2014, (laughs) wow, we've been doing this for a while, haven't we? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, time (laughs) flies. (laughs) Greg, your company is called Modbox. Tell us what that is, because they're really cool. Yeah, um, the genesis of the name was basically modern and then mailbox and mashing the two together to Modbox. Um. And when I completed my home, it's kind of a life story of it was a 50s tract ranch house that we renovated, and I couldn't find a mailbox that seemed to fit well with the home. And I sat on that for about a year until I opened up an atomic ranch issue and saw a really sweet kind of designed mailbox. And so I just started bird dogging that with thinking it might be design patent, looked in magazines, et cetera, until I identified that it did exist back in the 60s, uh, was no longer available. And so I decided to do a Kickstarter and start Modbox so we could bring it back to life. And we've um, actually got design patents on both our curbside and wall-mounted mailboxes. And these mailboxes, they're so strong. They're just unbelievable. Yeah, we um, kind of went back and I have scoured eBay. It's kind of hard to find a mailbox that's been outside for 60 years that's still around. 
but there were a few out there, so I got my hands on some. So we used the same heavy gauge metal um, as the original, which is about half, again, thicker than what you get from most mailboxes today. And what's really cool about it, besides the aesthetics, it has that sweet little thud noise when you open up the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... um. We have a magnet with a tab that it kind of clicks into place, so it is kind of a reassuring sound, if you will. (laughs) Yep, you've got mail. (laughs) Now, Matt, your company comes from your grandfather's products. Uh, Yes. um, My grandpa was an interesting guy. He was an engineer who, uh, in his early career, did projects for NASA, and then he quit that job and started his own business making A-frame cabins throughout the Rocky Mountains. And uh, he was just a guy that liked to make things. And I'm told that there was one of my uncles had an, an, uh, an allergy to real trees, and he didn't like the way that artificial Christmas trees looked. And so he made a tree, a collapsible tree, made out of concentric rings uh, back for our family in 1966. And so it was the tree that we grew up with. He only made a few for the family, but it was kind of a highlight for me for uh, Christmas spent or Christmas Eve spent at their house. And he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2010, and man, that was a a tough thing for me, and I didn't know what I could do for him other than to show the world his contribution to design. So made a few trees and went to the Denver Modernism Show, and just to get an idea of whether I loved the tree because he made it or whether aesthetically it was, you know, beautiful and good design, and I learned that um, it was resonating with people like it, it did in our family. So that was back in uh, 2012 when I, when I started it and been going strong ever since. And at some point, you jumped in the Shark Tank. Yeah, that's right. Um, thankfully, Shark Tank reached out to me because they were doing a holiday show. And uh, there aren't that many products in the marketplace that, um, you know, new products that were available. And so they reached out to me. And, yeah, that was... Uh, uh, 2017, and was able to to get a deal with Barbara Corcoran, who's been a good partner of mine. And so, yeah, that certainly provided some some good exposure. What's the best advice Barbara's given you so far? Um, eliminate my ideas to one per year. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be hard. <laughs> yes, it is. You have to um, wait another year for an idea. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's probably really good advice. Um, what she told me is that you aren't going to be successful by designing something new that resonates with people. What you need to do is take what you've already done and find the audience for that. And obviously, the mid-century modern world has adopted to it you know, early on. My hope is that, obviously, it resonates with with people outside of that design aesthetic and maybe introduces them to mid-century modern design. So, Matt, George said that this tree is, this modern Christmas tree is made of concentric rings. Yes. Or the original was. Rings of what? Pineapple? (laughs) No, they're (laughs) acrylic or or, or plastic. It's just made out of a plastic sheet. Oh, okay. Um, Also called plexiglass as well. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, so it's kind of transparent? That's correct. Um, I selected, and that's one of the the cool things about the tree, is how the LED that sits on the floor pointing up interacts with the rings. So I selected uh, translucent colors, red, green, and blue, uh, and clear, actually. And um, the most popular tree is kind of a a translucent white that I I, uh, didn't even bother to even make until people started to ask for it, and it's by far the most popular tree. And Greg, you've got several kinds of mod boxes now, right? You have the one that sits by the street, and don't you have yeah. one that attaches to the house? Yeah, we did a, a wall-mounted mod box also, uh, just kind of taking off on the very clean line. And there really, back in 2014, wasn't much out there. Somewhat happy to see, I guess, in a way, for all of the consumers out there that other people started stepping into the market. So you'll actually see more just modern mailboxes where folks have come in both curbside and wall mounted. I don't. I think there's enough market for everyone. It's kind of neat to see entrepreneurs bringing out interesting products for this, you know, the mid-century modern and modern market. I actually got pulled into a product also by a customer saying, "Hey, I'd really like an address plaque with these same kind of bright, fun colors." And so we put together and designed a, a very simple address plaque 
with anodized clear or black aluminum numbers that go on with magnets so they kind of offset and reveal in shadow. And so I had a customer pull me into a market, um, and they're doing quite well too. So it's kind of cool. Has anybody ever told you it looks like the Jetsons mailbox? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Awesome>. yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah, that's what you want. Yeah. Yeah, someone on Instagram just did a photo where they actually put some reflective tape on the angled post. And when a car hits it, it looks like it's a rocket taking <laughs> off. And you put a rocket oh, wow. up in the side. And it's just like it's gone really big on Instagram. We have uh, Matt can probably speak to this too. But we, as a small business with kind of a unique modern product, we have the best customers ever. I and mean, we get pictures from everyone that is very excited about the product in their home and being there. I mean, that really helps a small business when you buy direct from her and when they help get the word out to their friends. Like, um, uniquely Rochelle is a ballerina. And if you look at her Instagram, you can see her posing with the mod box. It's really cool. It nice. Helps. nice. It's what, what we used to call viral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not quite as big as viral though. I and mean, we're not hitting millions, but we'll take a thousand here and there for sure. <laughs> Gentlemen, how do people get up with you to find out about these products and order them? Matt, how can people reach you? So we sell our trees exclusively uh, through modernchristmastrees.com. That sounds like Greg does as well. And so you can go there and and see all our product line and see the the tree in the various uh, famous mid-century modern homes that we've paired the tree with. And Greg, how can people reach you? Yeah, we have uh, Modbox USA. If you type that in, you'll go to our website where we have all of our products arrayed. And um, we do actually get, sell in some other outlets. People kind of pulled us into some things. Um, but we we really like it if they go direct, because then we don't have to give up a commission. and It's all coming from the same place. So my word to folks would be, if you got a small business, you don't have to go to a large aggregation shop to buy it. A lot of times you'll actually get better customer service going direct, and it really helps us out because it helps our margins a little bit. So I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you yeah. all know that uh, if you have any issues with your product, you know the presidents of the company. That's right. Plus That's person correct. Yeah, and I think we probably both talk to many, many, many of the customers who end up purchasing our products. That's we great. do. I mean, I just got an email where the guy was like, it's just like the one we had when I was growing up. You know, it's great memories. So I love that. Cool. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having us and uh, happy holidays to everyone. Yep. Thank you, George. That was George talking with Matt Bliss of Modern Christmas Trees and Greg Kelly of Modbox. And now a few minutes with Frank Harmon reading from his book Native Places about one of our favorite mid-century architects, Harwell Hamilton Harris. I met the architect Harwell Hamilton Harris in 1981. I learned about him earlier when I was a student in London and I saw his hauntingly beautiful but very slight buildings that he built in California in the 1930s. In North Carolina, we became friends, and he acted as a mentor to me. This is what I wrote about him recently. Harwell. His hands had the grip of a lumberjack, but they could hold a prismacolor pencil as lightly as a lock of hair. If I compared him to another artist, it would not be to his idol, Frank Lloyd Wright, or his mentor, Rudolf Schindler, but to Fra Angelico, the 15th century Italian Renaissance artist who painted heaven on earth. You entered architect Harwell Hamilton Harris's home and studio in Raleigh, North Carolina, by crossing a bridge. You entered most of his projects by crossing a bridge, whether to a Presbyterian church or a one-room cottage. It was a gesture of farewell to the world. A bridge offered a welcome to one's own sheltered paradise, or, in the case of Harwell's own house, passage from a shabby street in North Carolina into a Fra Angelico. After his death from cancer in 1990, I dreamed of him. He limped down a green fluorescent lit corridor and passed through a drab aluminum and glass door. The door was his illness, which would burden him no longer. Suddenly, he became young. Then he strode into the distance, seeming to grasp the earth with each step. 
you'd never have to cross a bridge again. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by... Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for Modernist Houses. Okay, Tom, wrap us up. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarino researches guests while juggling two above-average children, three cats, nine chickens, pruning shears, and a glass of Australian Pinot Noir. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I'll be back soon with another locally designed, harken to the past, improve for the future, infill edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. 